General questions, and we move now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Planning officer, last week Willie Rennie failed to get a single answer from the First Minister on whether the SNP will support full EU membership in its manifesto. He should have waited a week because now we have two. Nicola Sturgeon's stated position is to be a full member of the European Union. Her MP's stated position is to leave the common fisheries policy. But full membership of the European Union means full membership of the common fisheries policy. Isn't that the case, First Minister? First Minister. Well, Ruth Davidson's clearly not been paying attention. The SNP has been consistent over many, many years in our criticisms of the common fisheries policy and very clear about our intentions to see it fundamentally reformed. Our 2007 manifesto continued to work for withdrawal from the CFP 2011. Uh, the CFP well passed its sell-by date, the 2014 White Paper on Independence. Independence for Scotland and the European Union would give Scotland the opportunity to take a leadership role in reforming the common fisheries policy. So the reality here is... It's the SNP that always stands up for Scottish fishing and always will stand up for Scottish fishing. And of course, the uncomfortable truth for Ruth Davidson is that it's successive Tory governments who have sold out the fishing industry. Remember the words, remember the words I know Ruth Davidson doesn't want to hear what's coming next, presiding officer. Remember the words of the Tories. In the wider UK context, the fishermen must be regarded as expendable. That's the Tory record on fishing. And of course, we know that the Tories are lining up to sell out fishing again because the Brexit white paper makes it clear that fishing will just be a negotiating chip in the Brexit talks. So the SNP stands up for fishing. Tories sell them out. Ruth Davidson. Priceless, presiding officer. She wants to quote internal SNP documents. Let me quote a document. It's chapter 13. Chapter 13 of a little thing called the EU Conditions of Membership. And it says it requires the introduction and participation in the common fisheries policy. And it doesn't get much clearer than that. So let's spell out the complete absurdity of the SNP's position here. Or should I say the positions? Firstly, it's the SNP's position that Brexit is a terrible threat to Scotland and that fishermen are better off being governed by the EU's hated common fisheries policy. That's the position that Angus Robertson outlined at the weekend when he said, we're in favour of Scotland being a member state of the European Union and we're in favour of a reformed common fisheries policy. But it's also their Brexit position that Brexit is a sea of opportunity for our fishermen and that we must avoid any policy, any practice, any regulation or any treaty which could return us to the common fisheries policy. And we know that because on Tuesday, Ailey Whiteford and Mike Weir, two of Mr Robertson's parliamentary colleagues, signed a pledge written by the Scottish Fishermen's Federation saying so. So can I ask the First Minister, is Mr Robertson wrong when he was on the telly at the weekend, or are Ms Whiteford and Mr Weir wrong? Or is it the SNP plan to try and say they're all right so that they think the people are so daft we won't notice? First Minister. Well, well, Ruth Davidson has managed to hold several different positions on Brexit all by herself. <laughs> Brexit. Brexit is a terrible threat to Scotland. It's what Ruth says is the SNP's position. The problem for Ruth Davidson is that that used to be Ruth Davidson's position as well. Remember her screaming it from Wembley. But now, of course, it's different. She's fallen into line with Theresa May and now Brexit is the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, on this issue, Ruth Davidson flip-flops more than a fish being landed. <laughs> flip-flop, flip-flop on Brexit. The truth of the matter, 
is that the SNP always has and always will stand up for fishing. You know, we've already heard about uh, the Tories thinking fishing is expendable. Expendable. That was the word that Tories used about Scotland's fishing industry. But let's come more up to date and let's read the Brexit white paper. Paragraph 8.16. Given the heavy reliance on UK waters of the EU fishing industry, it's in both our interests to reach a mutually beneficial deal that works for the UK and for the EU's fishing communities. Let me translate that for Ruth Davidson. That means the Tories are lining up in these negotiations to sell out the fishing industry and allow European countries what they say that they don't want, which is access to Scottish fishing waters. The Tories are preparing to perpetrate a con on Scotland's fishermen. They will not get away with it. It's the SNP who stands up for our fishing industry. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, maybe Nicola Sturgeon's MPs didn't report back to her, but let me quote to her what the chief executive of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation told them at, um, and MPs at Westminster just last week. Two secretaries of state, two ministers said the UK is leaving the EU and we'll leave the CFP and we will regain control of our fishing. She wants to go toe to toe over fishing. Let's bring that on. But presiding officer, presiding officer, this week, Mike Russell was in Brussels and he was speaking to fishing industry chiefs and his pitch was that Scotland will leave the EU with the rest of the UK but after independence it will go straight back in but it will opt out of all of the things it doesn't like including the common fisheries policy and it is utter nonsense. So right now we have SNP MPs and fishing communities saying the CFP is terrible and that Scotland would pull out. And at the same time, we've got Nicola Sturgeon standing up in Edinburgh, trying to win the vote of Remainers, saying they go straight back in. Doesn't even the First Minister see the utter hypocrisy here? First Minister. Utter consistency in the SNP's position over years on the common fisheries policy. What I see from the Tories is flip-flopping all the time on Brexit and on fishing. And if Ruth Davidson's argument today is that the Tories are not preparing to sell out the fishing industry, to use them as a bargaining chip in the negotiations that lie ahead, then I give Ruth Davidson the opportunity to explain in simple terms to the Chamber today what exactly the Brexit white paper means when it says that the UK government wants a deal that works for the EU's fishing communities. What does that mean if it doesn't mean allowing Spain and other countries access to European fishing waters? Why can't Ruth Davidson be honest with the fishing community? The Tories are preparing to treat them as expendable all over again. It's the SNP that will always stand up for fishing. So what does it Ruth Davidson. After Brexit, we'll be out of the CFP as members of her party that want to take us back in. But what we've got, presiding officer, what we've got is that the SNP saying they're in favour of joining the European Union, but the First Minister not confirming whether the SNP will back full membership in their manifesto. They say they're in favour of the common fisheries policy, except for MPs and fishing communities who say they're against it. And then we have the real whopper. In Scotland, we have Nicola Sturgeon saying the coming election hasn't anything to do whatsoever with independence. But from the broadcast studios of London, up pops Alex Salmond to confirm they want to use this election to mand a referendum that the rest of us don't want. So the First Minister thinks that on fishing, on EU membership and on independence, she can face both ways and promise all things to all people. Isn't it the case she's treating the electorate as fools? First Minister. Well, this election, of course, as I said yesterday morning, is an opportunity to determine who chooses Scotland's future. Is it a Tory government at Westminster or is it this democratically elected Scottish Parliament? Exactly the same as Alex Salmond's comments yesterday afternoon. But let's get back to fishing because what we've just seen here is Ruth Davidson all at sea drowning in our fishing waters because she can't explain and Ruth Davidson really has to explain this 
in simple terms to Scotland's fishing communities. I gave her the opportunity once and she failed to do so. So I'm going to give her the opportunity again. What does it mean when the UK government says that they want a deal that works for the EU's fishing communities? That can only mean that the Tories are preparing to sell out Scottish fishermen, grant other European countries access to fishing waters and treat that vital Scottish industry as expendable once again. I think that is crystal clear from Ruth Davidson today. It's the SNP that will always, as we always have done, stand up for Scottish fishing. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Next week, voters will go to the polls to decide the future of local services, like our schools. The First Minister used to claim that education was her number one priority, but even she doesn't claim that anymore. After 10 years of SNP government, Scottish education is facing challenges like never before. Since the SNP took office, there are 4,000 fewer teachers, 1,000 fewer support staff, and class sizes are bigger. International studies show that Scotland is declining in maths, in reading, and in science. John Swinney's response to this was to publish a mini manifesto repeating the very promises he's been breaking every year since 2007. So can the First Minister tell teachers, parents and pupils why they should believe the SNP this time around? First Minister. Well, education is my top priority. That's why... <laughs> Kezia Dugdale doesn't like to hear this, but that's why right now, across Scotland, head teachers and teachers have in their hands £120 million of additional funding. That's why local government services are better off to the tune of four hundred million pounds under this SNP government. And I would say to Kezia Dugdale that she has zero, not a shred of credibility left on the issue of local government funding. Because for years, in her local government manifesto, published just, just days ago, she complains about the council tax freeze, how it's strangling local government services. And yet of the eight councils freezing the council tax in this election, you know how many are Labour-led? All eight. This is sterling. Sterling Labour, freeze your council tax. So don't come here talking about funding for local services when it's your councils failing to raise the money we need for our schools. From the First Minister, who has cut £170 million out of local services this year alone. And if education was her top priority, then she would be listening to the teachers across Scotland who are crying out for help. Blackhall Primary School in Edinburgh felt the need to email all parents. The email said this, as you may be aware, there is currently a national shortage of teachers. This is making it challenging for head teachers around the country who are trying to fill vacant posts or indeed cover classes. There is a teacher shortage in Scotland. So will the First Minister be honest? How many schools are struggling like Black Hall? Just how many teacher vacancies are there across the whole of Scotland? First Minister. John Swinney, uh, myself, this government uh, have never shied away from the issue that Scotland like many countries uh, right now have an issue with teacher recruitment. That is one of the reasons why we have increased the intake to teacher training, to train more teachers to work in our schools and close the attainment gap. The fact of the matter is, it is this SNP government that is investing in local services. Whatever Kezia Dugdale tries to say, there is £400 million available extra in this financial year for council services. And the question for Labour is this. If they don't think there is enough money for council services, why are there eight Labour-led councils going into this election promising to freeze the council tax? Maybe Kezia Dugdale will give us a straight answer to that straight question. Kezia Dugdale. In all of that, presiding officer, there was no answer to the question that I asked. And I'll give the answer to the First Minister. The reality is, is that there are 
700 teacher vacancies in Scotland and 400 of them are in our secondary schools where pupils will begin their exams in just a matter of days. And I can reveal today that the government's own internal documents admit that it could take up to three years to fill these vacancies. Three years for the government to ensure that there are enough teachers to educate our children. Three years to clean up the mess the SNP have been making for the past ten. Three years to give our young people a fair chance in life. But we all know Nicola Sturgeon will spend the next three years campaigning for independence. So can the First Minister really keep a straight face and tell teachers, parents and pupils that once again education is her number one priority? First Minister. Well, as I said, we recognise the challenge in teacher recruitment. Scotland is not unique in that regard. That's why in this year, 2017, 18, we are making resources available to train, now Kezia Dugdale doesn't want to listen to this, to train an additional 371 teachers. It's why the General Teaching Council right now has a number of initiatives underway to encourage people back in to teaching, to encourage new people into teaching. These are the actions we are taking to tackle what is a problem and a challenge for many countries. And we're doing that, of course, in conjunction with our national improvement framework, with our attainment challenge, with our attainment fund, putting extra resources into the hands of head teachers. Because our commitment to raising attainment and closing that attainment gap is absolute. And we'll get on with the hard work of doing it, leaving Labour, as usual, carping on the sidelines. We have a couple of constituency questions. The first from Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that last Thursday, Diageo announced plans to cut up to 100 jobs in Scotland, potentially affecting up to 70 workers at their leaving premises in my constituency. The GMB union has laid the blame squarely at a damaging Tory hard Brexit. What assurances can the First Minister give my constituents, who now potentially face redundancy due to Conservative recklessness? First Minister. Well, obviously I was very concerned to learn that Diageo has begun a consultation with its staff over potential job losses at its sites in Leaven and Shield Hall. And I know that this will be an extremely anxious time for the company's employees and their families. Uh, Keith Brown has already arranged to meet with Diageo and officials in Scottish Enterprise are fully engaged with the company already. Uh, we will do all we can to explore all possible options for supporting the business and protecting jobs in Scotland. Uh, and while uh, the families and individuals affected by the situation also have the right to expect a similar response from the UK government. I think it is really troubling that the main union, the GMB, appears to have raised concerns about the impact of Brexit on these jobs and got very little response from the UK government. This is yet another example uh, of the threat that Brexit does pose to Scotland. What Ruth Davidson used to tell us but doesn't any longer, but what I still believe and examples like this sadly illustrate, but we will continue to do everything possible to support the workers at Diageo. John Lamond. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I declare an interest as a trustee of St Ab's Lifeboat Trust. One of the best examples of a community campaign that I've ever seen was the campaign in St Ab's in Berwickshire for the creation of an independent lifeboat when the RNLI withdrew their service. The community rallied together and organised a tremendous fundraising effort to raise the funds needed to establish their own lifeboat order, service order. for this important Listen part of the coastline. Lamin, please. When the donations started to roll in, the local St Abbs Community Trust was used to collect the funds whilst the new lifeboat trust was set up. The money was then transferred to the new lifeboat trust and the new boat was purchased. I had the pleasure of sitting beside the First Minister at the launch of the new lifeboat. On Twitter, the First Minister spoke of this incredible achievement of the community coming together and, they, and spoke of what they'd achieved, something special. It now transpires that Scottish Water's business stream have stripped St Abbs Community Trust of their water rates exemption for the Community Cafe and EBUS and the EBA Centre. Now, I've been in correspondence with the SNP's Environment Minister, but she has confirmed that she will not give the exemption for this Community Trust. Given the exceptional circumstances around this, will the First Minister, unlike her backbenchers, apply some common sense to this? First Minister. Well, this issue has been uh, already drawn to my attention, actually. The situation uh, with a water and sewerage charge of around £900 that has gone to St Abbs Community Trust. 
Uh, on the investigation I've done into the matter so far, this charge appears to be a direct result of their excellent efforts to raise funds for the St Abbs lifeboat, funds that didn't actually belong to the trust, which they held and then transferred to the lifeboat uh, trust's account when that uh, account was set up. Uh, Given those circumstances, I am hugely sympathetic to the situation they find themselves in. And I have actually this morning instructed my officials uh, to look again at this issue to try to find a solution. I was at the launch of the St Abbs lifeboat. It was a fantastic example of a community coming together uh, in order uh, to preserve a service that is vitally important to life in that community. So uh, having looked at this, it does seem unfair. Uh, that's why I've instructed officials to see what they can do to fix it. That's the kind of action people can expect from an SNP government. Question three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. <laughs> First Minister. I, I think I heard that question. Um, <laughs> Tuesday. Uh, can I just ask before Patrick Harvey speaks? I think the reason the First Minister couldn't hear is because the Deputy First Minister was shouting across the chamber in her ear. Can I suggest... I know this is an election time. Can I suggest all members are a little bit more respectful to all other members? We hear the questions and the answers. Patrick Harvey. If the Deputy First Minister wants to continue to distract the First Minister, it's no great skin off my nose. Can I, can I say that this week the, the Scottish Government uh, proposed tax cuts for aviation, which we all know, even though the Scottish Government at first denied it, uh, will increase carbon emissions that are driving climate change? increasing emissions at the time when we should be cutting them radically. Now, even if the First Minister thinks that aviation's damage to the climate can be ignored, it's clear that this tax cut will also be very unfair. Research published by the Green Party has shown just how unfair. Even if the airlines pass the full tax cut on through reduced ticket prices, the highest income households stand to gain far more than anyone else. Of the 90-odd million tax giveaway going to UK leisure passengers alone, the richest 10% of households will gain over 33 million, while the poorest 10% will stand to benefit by just eight and a half. While public transport that people depend on every day remains expensive and unreliable, how can it possibly be fair to offer a tax break that drives up both pollution and inequality? First Minister. Well, can I uh, deal with both of those issues? Firstly, the, the climate change issue, because that uh, is extremely important to this government. We are, of course, meeting our climate change targets, and we have some of the most ambitious climate change targets uh, anywhere in the world. The UK Committee uh, on Climate Change has previously commented on this issue and made the point, and it's a point uh, that I would endorse more generally, that where any policy uh, has a potential uh, adverse effect on uh, emissions, then that increases the responsibility of government to make sure uh, that we balance that in other ways. And our overall ambition uh, to meet those climate change uh, targets is uh, absolute uh, as a commitment that the government has set. Now, on the wider issue of uh, reducing ADT, and uh, I should say, of course, the, the discussions and vote in Parliament this week was not on rates of uh, ear discount uh, tax. It was about transferring the legal responsibility over this from the Westminster Parliament to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, this is about uh, trying to improve the connectivity of Scotland because we know that improving the connectivity of Scotland is one of the key things we need to do to grow the economy of Scotland. And we all know that growing the economy of Scotland is really important in terms of supporting the public services that all of us rely on. That's why we have to have a balance in our policies. Uh, but we have, as uh, Patrick Harvey will be aware, in response to the Finance and Constitution Committee's uh, Stage 1 report, uh, already confirmed that we will commission an independent economic uh, assessment and that the government will bring forward tax exemptions at Stage 2. So there will be plenty of opportunity uh, for the Parliament to scrutinise the detail of this. But it is important that we get our policies right in the round so that yes we are supporting our vital public services but we are also supporting the economic growth that is so vital to doing exactly that. Patrick Harvey. Well the vote this week indeed wasn't on rates and bans and the Green Party will move amendments to introduce some social and environmental principles into that legislation uh, and we won't vote for it unless those pass. But the, the, the First Minister cites the UK Committee on Climate Change who have argued for a cap on aviation emissions growth. 
She also says uh, that we need more connectivity. Well, it's perfectly clear from the in continuing growth of our existing aviation that air passenger duty has not stopped that growth. Even for routes where rail is a perfectly viable option, we are failing to make sure that it's the affordable choice for people to make. Relentless aviation growth cannot possibly be sustainable. Now, we have visitors today to Parliament who are the most directly affected people by that growth, affected by the noise and pollution from increasing flights here in Edinburgh and those campaigning against an additional runway at Heathrow. The aviation industry itself can well afford to lobby hard, sponsoring lavish events here at Westminster and even at the First Minister's party conference. But should we not be listening more closely to those whose lives will be most affected by increased inequality, by increased pollution here at home and by the effects of climate change around the world? And is it not time that the Scottish Government had a coherent policy on aviation levels, including a cap on the emissions and protection for communities from the direct impacts that they have to live with on a daily basis. First Minister. Well, firstly, trying to find some consensus there. Of course, it's important that all voices are listened to. Uh, the Scottish Government has made clear our views that there are, in our view, benefits uh, to Scotland from Heathrow expansion. But it will be for the UK Government in taking forward uh, that policy to answer the questions on uh, the impact on people living around that area and also the impact on the environment. And of course, we will continue to pay very close attention uh, to the answers to those questions and to the case that is made as it develops. On our own policy, uh, you know, Patrick Harvey talks about relentless growth in aviation. That, that's not what I'm proposing. It's not what the Scottish Government is proposing uh, or advocates. But what we do advocate uh, are good connections for Scotland. Of course, good rail connections uh, are vitally important. And I would uh, encourage people to use the train when travelling uh, across the UK. But our economy also needs good aviation connections. And we know over past years uh, the constraints that there has been in our economy from the lack of certain routes and the lack in particular of direct flights in and out of Scotland. So we need to get these policies right. We must grow our economy. How many times, rightly and understandably, in this chamber do we talk about the challenges facing Scotland's economy and the need to have policies to grow our economy? So that is a key priority of the government. And connections for business, for exporters, is a vital part of that. But of course, we have to make sure that all of our policies uh, taken together past the climate change challenge. And it would be one thing to level these criticisms at the Scottish Government if we were not meeting our climate change ambitions. But not only are we meeting our climate change ambitions, and have been praised by the Committee on Climate Change for a record here, we are meeting those targets ahead of schedule. We're not complacent about that. We want to up our ambition and go further. But we need to have balance in our policies so that we support economic growth, so that we can have the support <coughs> for the public services that all of us across this chamber want to see. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. <coughs> Excuse me, President Officer. Matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. The, the First Minister has done nothing in the last 20 minutes to avoid our party looking shifty and evasive on Europe and independence. <laughs> the First Minister said on Monday, this election is not about independence. Yesterday, we see her sitting on a Yes to Independence branded motorbike in the shadow of the Wallace Monument on the B Road to Bannockburn. <laughs> Can the First Minister tell me what is her position today? First Minister. Well, my position is as it has always been. So Willie Rennie should maybe listen carefully because he seems to be struggling to understand it. I support Scotland being independent and an independent member of the European Union. There you go. How can Willie Rennie struggle to understand that? And he's right, I did go to Bannockburn uh, yesterday, actually. I went to uh, visit a, a fantastic heritage project, uh, the restoration or the uh, attempted proposed restoration of Bannockburn uh, House, uh, where Bonnie Prince Charlie uh, stayed uh, back in those days. So that was a fantastic visit yesterday. And I am proud in this election, proud in this election to be getting out there, 
making the case for a strong opposition to the Tories at Westminster and making the case that on the key questions, independence and other key questions, it should be the voice of this parliament, this democratically elected parliament that determines the future of Scotland, not the voice of an increasingly right-wing Tory government at Westminster. Willie Rennie. Does she th really think we're all buttoned up the back? She said, she's, once again, once again, she has refused to say that this is what the election is about. But her predecessor was on the radio saying exactly that's what it is about. It's about independence, first, last, and every priority. Last week, she was evasive about her future plans on Europe. This week, utter confusion about independence. Starting with denial, and ending with a Hells Angels tour of the Central Belt. <laughs> Meanwhile, the economy is teetering on the edge of recession. International education rankings have slipped, and the mental health strategy is months behind schedule. She should be ashamed of that record. The best way out of all of this is for her to do just what the majority of people in this country would applaud her for. Why can't she just cancel this divisive independence referendum campaign and get back to her job for Scotland? First Minister. So says the guy that's going around the country arguing for a second EU <laughs> referendum. I mean, and... In, answer, in direct answer to Willie Rennie's first question, I think most people watching this would start to think that, yes, the Liberal Democrats appear to button up the back. <laughs> so, Willie, if the cap fits, perhaps you should uh, wear it. But, you know, on a more serious matter, Willie Rennie raises, Willie Rennie raises in passing issues like education and the economy and mental health. I agree that these are fundamentally important issues, which begs the question why Willie Rennie didn't take the opportunity of these questions today to actually ask me about any of these matters. He had the opportunity. Here am I, standing here. He can ask me anything he likes, but chooses not to ask me about education, health or the economy. And do you know why that is, presiding officer? Because all of the opposition parties here Actually, they're the ones that only want to talk about independence. And why is that? Because it's a smokescreen. It's a smokescreen, presiding officer, because none of them, none of them are prepared to talk about their own policies or their own record. So let me tell you what I'm going to work in this election to do. I'm going to work to win this election. There's no other party in this chamber prepared to say that that's what they are trying to do. A couple of supplementaries. The first one, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I do have a question on uh, domestic matters. It's about education. Um, the First Minister will be aware that college lecturers are on strike today and they're gathering outside Parliament for a rally this afternoon after ACAS talks on Tuesday aimed at resolving the ongoing industrial dispute failed to reach a solution. Now, the SNP have been promising lecturers equal pay since 2011. Lecturers have already compromised by agreeing to stagger pay harmonisation over three years up to 2019. But despite this, the deal that was agreed last year still hasn't been honoured. What message does the First Minister have for the striking lecturers? And what urgent action are ministers taking to resolve the disputes? First Minister. So, firstly, in terms of uh, the lecturers that are uh, visiting Parliament today, uh, the Minister for Further Education and, and Higher Education will meet with them uh, later today, or representatives of them later today. Um, I want to see this dispute resolved because strike action in our colleges is in no one's interest. It's certainly not in the interest of college students. But let me be clear what has happened here. We have put in place, as we were asked to do, arrangements for national bargaining. Now, when you have arrangements for national bargaining, then it then becomes ultimately a matter for the trade union and the employers to resolve. Now, as I understand it, and clearly 
pay close, close attention to these matters. This is not actually a dispute about pay. Uh, the pay increases uh, have broadly been agreed. This is now a dispute about terms and conditions, about uh, the amount of class contact time and numbers of holidays. So I would uh, encourage certainly the employers uh, to go the extra mile to resolve this dispute and I hope in discussion uh, with the union uh, they will be able to do that. I think the move to national bargaining is a significant step forward but once you have governments having to step in to resolve these things you no longer have national bargaining so if we want national bargaining that's going to work then both sides have to be prepared to come to a resolution and I very much hope that happens and happens very soon. Tavish Scott. But thank you for signing off, sir. The First Minister will know that farmers and crofters have three weeks to make 2017 payment applications. She will also know that the £180 million computer system to make these payments does not work. Uh, given it continues not to work, will she undertake to give her long-suffering officials in department offices across Scotland the tools in order to make their job possible? And that does not include continuing with a computer system that does not work. First Minister. Well, of course, we uh, support our officials uh, working across the country and officials uh, working on these matters are working exceptionally uh, hard. We will ensure they are equipped with the tools they need to do the job. It is vitally important that payments uh, to crofters and to farmers more generally are paid and are paid on time. And Fergus Ewing is very uh, focused on that. I'm very happy to ask Fergus Ewing to meet with Tavish Scott uh, to discuss the action we are taking to listen to any uh, concerns he continues to have uh, and set out what we're doing to address them. Question number five, Fulton McGregor. <coughs> Thank you, sir. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to protect children and young people online. Minister. Uh, last week, the Minister for Children and Early Years launched the Scottish Government's National Action Plan on Internet Safety <coughs> for Children and Young People. It contains a range of actions we will undertake, working in partnership with the police, health boards, third sector organisations and, crucially, children and young people themselves. Our approach seeks to help children and young people develop the skills they need to stay safe on the internet and to support parents and carers to be more aware of the potential risks that their children face online. Fulton McGregor. I welcome this development. It is vital that we all do what we can to keep children safe in every aspect of their lives. Can the First Minister advise what role is envisaged for service providers and technology businesses who clearly also have a key responsibility to protect children from harm online? First Minister. Well, the online industry and, uh, I have to say, so social media providers in particular have a key role and a key responsibility uh, in ensuring that children and young people do stay safe online. Uh, and I think it is reassuring to see the industry taking its responsibility to protect children seriously through a range of actions and measures. But we should continue where it's uh, necessary to put pressure on the industry to take the action that is uh, appropriate because there is more for uh, the industry and for providers to do. Uh, indeed, I think there's more we can all do uh, to help keep children safe online. So the action plan that we published last week sets out how the government uh, will take the steps that are for us to take. Uh, and I look forward to the industry playing its role fully, working with ministers and other stakeholders to implement its measures. I mean, the internet overwhelmingly is a, a force for good and we should embrace that positively. Uh, it opens new worlds to children every single day. But the downside are the dangers and the risks that children face. So we must tackle them so that children can continue to enjoy and benefit from the internet in the ways that many of them do. Question six, Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the accuracy of the JERS figures. First Minister. Uh, JERS is a national statistics publication, which means that it has been independently assessed by the UK Statistics Authority to ensure that it meets the code of practice for official statistics. Uh, that code ensures that statistics are of high quality and of public value. Uh, JERS estimates the level of public revenue raised in Scotland and the level of public spending for residents of Scotland under the current constitutional arrangements. Uh, it is based on uh, a range of estimates uh, and it is not... It's not an indication of the finances of an independent Scotland, which of course would be dependent on a range of other factors, including the spending choices and priorities of the government of the day. Liam Kerr. I thank the First Minister for that reply. But she has to say that to those SNP supporters, including members of this chamber, who in recent months have mounted a concerted campaign to undermine and delegitimise JERS. So can she also put on record that JERS are official statistics, produced by her government to the highest standards, and that those who denigrate the figures are, including in this chamber, as a matter of fact, simply wrong. 
First Minister. Well, can I recommend uh, to the member that when he comes here and asks a question, he actually manages to listen to the answer? Let me repeat what I said in my first answer. He, asked, he stood up there in his supplementary and asked me to put on record that they are national statistics. The first words in my original answer were, Jers is a national statistics publication. A bit of listening instead of heckling might have gone down well. The point I'm making, the point, simple point I'm making is this, is that Jers doesn't tell us anything much about the finances of an independent Scotland. And it's not just... Me that says that the Fraser of Allender Institute says that JERS reflects current constitutional arrangements. And of course, we have the, uh, a leading anti independence campaigner who himself said in radio recently nobody suggests that the JERS figures show what a future independent Scotland would look like. So, yes, they are official statistics. Official statistics are known for being high quality and of public value. Uh, they have a range of estimates underpinning them, as everybody is aware of. But crucially, they reflect the position in Scotland, as the Fraser <coughs> of Allender Institute says, under current constitutional arrangements, not under independence. Question number seven, Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government will take to ensure that older people receive the free personal care payments that they are entitled to in light of research by Age Scotland, which suggests that thousands are missing out due to delays in assessing and arranging care. First Minister. Well, Age Scotland's figures show that 95% of older people assessed as needing care receive the services they need within six weeks, and the majority of assessments for older people with critical or substantial needs are actually conducted within two and a half weeks. Uh, now, that said, no one should have to wait longer than necessary to receive their care package. Uh, that's why we continue to work closely with councils to make provision even better than it already is. Alec Rowley. Officer, I thank the First Minister for that question, but the fact remains that for many individuals and for many families, far too often their experience of health and social care is not always a good one. It was Pope Francis, presiding officer, who said, where there is no honour to the elderly, there is no future for the young. Being able to provide support and care for older people in Scotland at the point where they need that support and that care must be the accepted will of every Scottish Government. Will the First Minister agree to set up a review that will examine the progress to date in rolling out integrated health and social care, looking at what is working, what is not working and why it's not working, uh, and building on best practice across Scotland to ensure that every individual who needs health and social care is able to access it. First Minister. Well, I agree very strongly, actually, with the sentiments behind Alec Rowley's question. How we care for our older people is very often the mark of a civilised society, which is why I think we should all be proud of free personal care in this country, and we should also all be proud that the vast majority of older people uh, get good, high-quality care and they get it uh, timorously upon an assessment that says that they need that care. Yes, there are still some individuals for whom that is not the experience, and we must and we are determined to continue to work uh, to resolve that. It's exactly uh, for that reason that we did take the step as a government, a step that you know, no previous government was prepared to do, to formally, uh, by statute, integrate health and social care. It's also why, as Alec Rowley is aware, we are now doing, again, the very difficult thing that governments have shied away from for a long, long time, of transferring money from acute health services into social care and community care in recognition of the fact that it's those services uh, that are absolutely essential for individuals, particularly older people, but also essential when it comes to relieving the pressure on our acute health service. Uh, Alec Rowley asked for a review. I, I would say to him that the, the, the progress of integration is under constant monitoring and review and will continue to be so. It is absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, initiatives of that magnitude uh, clearly will have challenges along the way. But I already speak uh, on a regular basis to people working in both health and social care in different parts of the country who point to improvements that are already being made because of that integration. So we're delivering, uh, we the uh, people out there uh, working in these services are delivering a high quality service for the vast majority of older people and our determination working with local authorities, the health service and voluntary organisations who are absolutely crucial here as well is to make sure that that's the experience for absolutely every single older person in Scotland. Christine Graham. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister is aware, the introduction of free personal care in 2002 has saved over the 15 years tens of millions to the Treasury because they're not required to pay out attendance allowance. Tens of millions that could have gone towards free personal care. Does the First Minister agree with me that it's ironic, indeed hypocritical, that in the same breath, as the Tories defend their cruel rape clause and demand the Scottish Government provides funding to support victims of that callous clause, they refuse to pay out savings that we have made in this Parliament through our compassionate policies. First Minister. Uh, Christine Graham is absolutely right. It, actually, it remains something of a national scandal that the UK Government clawed back attendance allowance from Scotland following the introduction of free personal and nursing care under a previous administration in 2002. Um, and Christine Graham talks, uh, I think she said, I may have misheard her, about the tens of millions of pounds uh, that have been lost to this government as a result of that move by uh, past and uh, current UK governments. Let me tell her exactly how much that is over the past 15 years. It now amounts to 600 million pounds. More than half a billion pounds that rightly should be here in Scotland helping to support our older people uh, that is now currently in the pockets of the London Westminster Treasury. Now, that policy, I have to say, was started by a, a Labour UK government, but it's been continued by a Tory UK government. So if either of those parties now wants to say that they stand up for pensioners, although that will be difficult from the Tories who are preparing to abandon the triple lock on pensions, of course. But if either of these parties uh, want to come here and talk about what more we need to do for older people, then their support for this government, trying to get that money back for Scotland, would certainly be overdue, but it would be very welcome indeed. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Ms Davison. Presiding officer, during this edition of First Minister's Questions, Nicola Sturgeon made a number of claims. One of them was that there wasn't a fag paper between her and Alex Salmond's position on whether this general election is or is not about independence. And the second, in response to Willie Rennie, was that only the opposition wants to talk about independence. I'm wondering if the First Minister is aware that at the exact time she was making those statements, her predecessor, Alex Salmond, was on Sky News and is quoted as saying that this general election, one of the issues will be whether to back our Parliament's right to decide when we have an independence refer uh, referendum and that it would reinforce the mandate of Holyrood to do so. And I'm just wondering, presiding officer, if the First Minister would like to reconsider uh, her uh, quotes uh, in light of this embarrassing intervention by her predecessor at the time that she was speaking. Thank you. Sorry, First Minister. It's a point of order for the Chair. It's a point of order for the Chair, not for debate. Can I just suggest that these matters are best pursued outside this chamber? Excuse me, Mr Fitzpatrick. It's a point of order. It's a question for the Chair to rule on. As I... As I do rule, it's not a point of order. These are debating points to be conducted in a general election context outside this chamber. The point has been made. There is not, I'm sorry, it is not to open up a debate. It's a question for the chair. That's not a point of order. We're finished decision. We're finished FMQs. We'll move on to members' business now. I would ask members to leave the chamber quietly. And it's members' business in the name of Neil Findlay.